Welcome to another video lesson in the series for diabetes education. What is type 2 diabetes? Well, we know that it's absolutely epidemic in our culture right now. In fact, I don't know. You might even have it. Or maybe you don't want it. So you need to learn about it so that you can avoid it. So if you have type 2 diabetes or are at high risk for type 2 diabetes, which means prediabetes, you want to listen to this video. Don't ignore this, because this is happening to children. It is no longer considered adult onset diabetes. So what is type 2 diabetes? Well, it's actually a disease of insulin resistance. Your body needs to use insulin as the key to get sugar into your cell and be burned for energy. That's how our bodies work. Without insulin, your bodies will not be able to get sugar into your cells efficiently. And when you develop insulin resistance, you will not be able to use your insulin efficiently. So therefore, we want to avoid insulin resistance in the first place. So what causes insulin resistance? It's usually belly fat. Too many carbohydrates, which is a very high intake of energy and too little exercise, which is too low an energy output. Everybody knows this. You eat too much or you exercise too little, you're probably going to gain weight. And that's going to give you weight in your abdomen, belly fat. So we're talking about a normal versus abnormal metabolism. Because a normal metabolism, you would eat your food, you would do your exercise throughout the day, and you probably wouldn't gain very much weight at all. But sometimes people might eat too much or exercise too little, which will eventually give you abnormal metabolism, insulin resistance, and you will gain weight in your belly. You can watch other video lessons about why this is happening in our society because of our food. So. Our bodies make insulin in the pancreas. They're made in certain cells called the beta cells. The beta cells are little insulin factories. I want you to think of those little guys working in a factory all day long. Well, if you eat a lot of foods that raise your blood sugar, you're going to need more insulin. And when you need more insulin, you need to tell those guys to work harder, to make more insulin. Now, two things are going to happen. Number one, they're going to get tired. They're not going to be able to keep up with the demand. And the second thing that we know is that insulin is a hormone of storage. The main reason for insulin is that human beings did not eat every day. Many mammals on this planet do not eat every day. So therefore, insulin is a hormone that will store excess calories that we don't need today to be used for tomorrow in the form of belly fat. All mammals have this capability because if you don't eat, we can't have them dropping dead all over the place. So it's important that you understand that the more insulin you're demanding out of your pancreas because of your high sugar or high glycemic index carb diet, the more you're going to gain weight. Insulin will always help your body to take excess carbohydrates that are calories and store them for body fat. Can't do it without insulin. Now when you become insulin resistant, that means you're asking your, your pancreas to make even more insulin. And that puts even more stress on the beta cells. Now you will develop chronic inflammation when you have high levels of blood sugar and high levels of circulating insulin. See, human beings are not meant to have high levels of sugar or high levels of insulin. So this is something that our bodies are not well equipped to deal with. Another fallout from having too much sugar in your bloodstream and too much insulin circulating, you'll have a reduced availability of nitric oxide. Now nitric oxide is something that lives in our bloodstream, in our arteries, that helps to relax the arteries. It's a vasodilator. And when you don't have enough nitric oxide because of reduced availability due to chronic inflammation, your arteries will be tighter 
you can develop hypertension. Another thing that will happen during all of this chronic inflammation is an increase in ages, A-G-E. Ages are accelerated glycated end products. Now glycation is something that happens. Everybody knows about antioxidants. We want to eat foods that have antioxidants. Well, oxidation or glycation happens constantly. It's what helps us to grow old. All right, but it also is something that we don't want to have more of, any more than we need. So you will have an increase in your accelerated glycated end products. And what will happen during that accelerated glycation or the, ox the oxidation is they will deposit in your arteries, contributing to cardiovascular disease. They will also deposit in your joints contributing to arthritis and the eventual crumbling of your cartilage. And then the last thing is hyperglycemia, which is high blood sugar. This is absolutely going to happen as your beta cells become more and more burned out from chronic inflammation, chronic high sugars, and chronic insulin resistance. So diagnosis and symptoms. How do you get diagnosed and what are my symptoms? Unfortunately, you'll probably feel nothing well into dangerous levels. I've, diagno I've diagnosed people in my office with hemoglobin A1Cs of 12 and 13. These people have dangerously high levels of blood sugar and they don't feel a thing. And that dangerous level of high blood sugar will lead to complications of diabetes, complications like a heart attack, needing stents, Deposits of fat and cholesterol in your arteries all starts with the inflammation that starts with high blood sugars. As well as complications of diabetes like bleeding behind the eye, retinopathy, numbness and tingling in your feet and hands, which is neuropathy, kidney disease, which is a reduction in your kidney's ability to clean your blood, which is nephropathy. Another thing is your A1C will likely be the first sign that any medical practitioner sees to know that you're having this problem. So get this important blood test. If we ever test your blood two hours after a meal, which I highly recommend, this is also a very early sign of diabetes, but it's rarely done. It's not convenient to test your blood sugar two hours after a meal. But if you have the ability to do so, please test your blood sugar two hours after a meal. If it's over 140, you're prediabetes. If it's over 200, you're a diabetic. A late sign of diabetes is your fasting sugar. This, unfortunately, is the most common blood test that medical pr providers will do to know if you are at risk for diabetes or prediabetes but it's a late sign. What that means is it's one of the last things to rise. So you may have diabetes and prediabetes, but your fasting blood sugar may be normal. So it does not mean you're safe. It just means that it's a late sign and it's not rising yet. Far better is a two hour after a meal or two hour postprandial blood sugar or an A1C. Now all of this takes many years but it does awful damage to your body. So what are the changes that you should expect if you have diabetes or prediabetes? Well, there's permanent and semi-permanent physiological changes that happen to your body. Number one is obesity. Obesity will definitely cause your beta cells to reduce. And when your beta cells are making less insulin, and eventually it will necessitate you to take insulin injections to control your blood sugar. Another fallout of obesity is cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, and this can occur before you even know you have type 2 diabetes. Many, many patients who come into the emergency rooms all over the country with chest pain are found to have had a heart attack. They get to their stents or they have open heart surgery and that's when they're told they have diabetes. And the third thing that happens with obesity, renal problems, kidney problems, 
chronic renal insufficiency. And this occurs even more profoundly if you also have high blood pressure in conjunction to high blood sugars. Another problem of obesity is skeletal deformities due to your weight. The longer you stay overweight, the more skeletal changes you will experience. Skeletal changes like back problems, leg problems, knee problems. When you walk around all day long carrying an extra 20, 50, or 100 pounds or more, your body must compensate by walking differently. It puts a huge stress on your feet, which are really just a bunch of bones, little bones, put together by muscles, ligaments, and tendons. So if you cannot exercise because of your weight, please get into a pool where you basically, it doesn't matter how much you weigh, and swim or tread water or do a water aerobics because this will make it easier for your body to lose weight without the stress on your joints and your lower extremities like your legs. Another problem with being obese, neuropathy. I see people who have neuropathy, which is a numbness and tingling in their lower legs, and they're obese, but they don't even have, they don't have high sugars yet. And it could lead to a lifetime of pain management. Another problem with obesity, low levels of vitamin D. Now vitamin D is not just a vitamin, it's actually a hormone. We don't have enough information about it to really know what it does for us, but we know it's important. And a lot of people will have low levels of vitamin D when they're overweight. We don't understand yet the correlation. Is it the low levels of vitamin D that help you to gain weight? Or is it that you gain weight and it reduces your levels of vitamin D? The research is not done on that yet. And the, so many of the complications that come along with being overweight and being obese is retinopathy, cataracts, and even macular degeneration. This is a problem that happens to a lot of older people, and they don't realize that it's all related to the foods that they ate, their sugars throughout their lifetime. So another problem is beta cell burnout. This is something that's going to happen to the beta cells in your pancreas that make insulin if you cannot keep your sugars under control. And losing weight and exercising is the best way. So once you have type 2 diabetes, it's not a question of if you will need insulin. It's a question of when. And then eventually you will become dependent on that insulin injection. It will complicate your life immeasurably. So many patients are now considering bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is when a permanent change is made to your stomach. It can be a temporary change, like a lap band surgery or a gastric sleeve. Or it can be the complete change of your stomach, where your whole stomach is basically put to the side and your new stomach is made and it's very small. There's many complications that come along with this surgery. Weight loss and glycemic control occurs almost immediately for almost all people who have this surgery. It's not because anything was done other than severe calorie restriction. It's actually due to about 1,700 calories per week. That's what most people will eat their first few weeks after bariatric surgery, 1,700 calories a week. So of course they're going to lose weight, but that won't last for very long. Many people regain weight eventually and at a higher than desirable percentage. Only a relatively small amount of people will keep the weight off long term. So it's not an easy way to continue living. But it can be life-saving for the morbidly obese. Malabsorption problems, dumping syndrome, vitamin deficiencies. The list goes on of the complications of bariatric surgery. So be careful and get your questions answered before you go for this type of very serious surgery. I'm Christine Livieri, your paleo practitioner.